So Julia Collins, I met probably first, is, it was in the fall of this last year, so maybe about eight months ago. And she came in to Sparrow and gave an incredible description of her passion uh, for her new company. And that was just the kind of founders that we love to see. And those are the kind that are successful. It, it, so uh, she's the CEO of her new startup, which is Planet Forward, uh, whose mission basically is to reverse climate change through snacking. And you just gotta love that. And she's gonna talk a little bit about that along the way. Um, before Planet Forward, she was the co-founder and president of Zoom Pizza, which worked to have a human and robotic interface to provide sustainable food that could, uh, that could help the planet. She was on the management team of the Harlem Jazz Enterprises, won Best New Restaurant in America in 2014, is still involved in a couple of different restaurants in Harlem. She, has, uh, she worked at Union Square Ventures, or I'm sorry, Union Square Hospitality Group, uh, which uh, worked with companies uh, such as Shake Shack. You know, you notice the theme here. It's all about, which we're going to talk about. Uh, she has a degree in government studies uh, from Harvard, and then somehow between all of that, also managed to get an MBA at Stanford. So it is a great pleasure uh, to introduce you to Julia Collins. Thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. Uh, it's it's a, a great pleasure. I'm super excited about our session. Um, so all of the stuff that you've done, you've been incredibly successful, you've done all these amazing things, and they're all around food. It, you, it, it's as if you, you, you look at the challenges that the world has through the lens of food. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like why that is. Why is food so central? Yeah, you know, it's been this way for me since I was a little girl. I grew up in the kind of household where the table was the center of everything. And I, I see in the audience a good friend from my childhood, Kelly Thomas Drake, who probably remembers some of these times. Um, but you know, my grandparents, like many black people from the South, moved to the North during the Great Migration. And they brought with them their folk ways and their food ways. And um, there was just this real belief that part of what makes us human is that we share food together. And in my house, we talked about social justice and politics and race over oatmeal. It was very normal. And I think the reason why we were able to have those kind of courageous conversations so fluidly was because there was food in front of us. We were sharing food together. Um, I've always had this idea, you know, since I was a little girl, I had this idea that I could build a career in food, but I wasn't quite sure how to get there. Mark, it took me some time. Um, you know, uh, something that's also true about my upbringing was that my family was very achievement focused. You know, it was, uh, and, and that's not a bad thing, but um, I remember the first time I told my grandfather, you know, who is trained in dentistry and, you know, sort of overcome so, overcame so many obstacles to build a dental practice in San Francisco during a time when that was not the norm for black people in America. I remember telling him that I wanted to get into food and I think he like cried a little tear. He was not happy. <laughs> um, so I sort of had this circuitous route to finding my, my way. Um, and somewhere along the way, I also became really obsessed with science and math and technology. And I initially went to Harvard to study biomedical engineering. That was my plan. I sort of fell into government um, and African-American studies, which is a good thing. Um, but, you know, I just fundamentally believe that food is the, is the universal medium for human connection. And I will say more, more practically, Mark, and then I promised to, to put a fine point on it and we can move on to the next question. But, you know, when we think about climate change, which is the problem that I'm really tackling right now, it's probably not a surprise to you that 23% of greenhouse gas emissions globally come from our food system. And I'm not saying that there's a silver bullet to the climate crisis, but I certainly believe that addressing our food system is a very good place to start when we're thinking about how to tackle climate change this decade. Yeah, absolutely. It really is about food and energy. You know, if we can 
if we can get those two things solved, everything else is kind of uh, falls into place. Yeah. Well, so maybe this is a good time to, to talk a little bit about Planet Forward and, and yeah. how, the, how we're going to snack our way into the future. Absolutely. So the mission of Planet Forward is to help tackle climate change by making it easier to bring climate friendly food and beverage products to market. The initial idea from this company came for me when my son was born and I like many of us had always been aware of the urgency around climate justice, but there was something about being responsible for another human being that really brought the conversation into a narrow focus. And I became frankly obsessed with what I could do as an individual, as a founder, as a parent to tackle the problem. And so the first idea that I had was around snacks. It was, what if I were to create the world's first explicitly climate friendly food brand? that was positioned in that way, that was communicated in that way, that helped consumers to understand the relationship between their choices at the grocery store and the kind of climate impact that they want to have. So it started as this idea for a snack brand, but as I got going, I realized it was so difficult to actually find all of the information that I needed to buy the right ingredients, to purchase the right materials for that brand. And as I went, Mark, I started building up more and more data and putting it together and connecting it and tagging it. And I essentially had to build for myself a little lightweight software layer in order to be able to do the kind of data validation and analysis that I needed to create a climate friendly brand. And so then I had sort of this light bulb moment where I realized anybody who wants to create a climate friendly food product is going to need the same set of information that I'm creating for myself. So rather than just create it for my own brand, why don't I make this available as a software tool for any brand who wants to create a climate friendly product? And so that's what Planet Forward is doing. I think that is such a great description of an entrepreneurial mindset of going along and then seeing the need. You know, you're doing one thing and, and in order to do that one thing, you find that you have this like potentially much more interesting, greater market that has a bigger impact along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is, uh, that is great. Uh, I noticed on your website, since I did, you know, lurk you on, on the website, uh, you mentioned about regenerative agriculture. Yes. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. So regenerative agriculture. So let me put a little framing around this. So the conversation that we're talking about is um, often called sustainability. Some people call it environmentalism. When we're talking about regeneration, we're talking about moving beyond sustainable and really moving toward a place where, as a result of our farming practices, we're helping to reverse some of the damage that's done. So there's nothing wrong with sustainability. Sustainability is about sort of sustaining the, the current level of resources so that they don't decline too much. But regeneration was so much more exciting for me because regeneration is about turning back the hands of time, not only emitting less greenhouse gases, but actually helping to draw down and sequester carbon. Regenerative agriculture is first and foremost, a collection of farm management practices that when used in a given landscape can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also rebalance carbon. And the, what's beautiful about this practice for farmers is, of course, we all love the climate friendly benefits of these practices. But from the perspective of a farmer, these kinds of practices also create healthier soil. And soil is the lifeblood of our food system. Soil is the giver of life for, for, for so many things on the planet. When you have a healthy soil, you have a healthy farm system and therefore healthy humans. Oh, that's fantastic. And, you know, I'm from the Central Valley, you know, from Sacramento. Uh, and, you know, the farming there is not particularly sustainable, although it's getting, it's getting better. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you have any, do you ever uh, venture out into the, the hinterlands there and, and uh, see farms in the Central Valley? Yes. And that was part of the practice um, you talked about the entrepreneurial journey and, and, and these inflection points that you have along the way. 
part of what helps me to get to the kind of inflection points or insights that I need to inform my path forward is a lot of listening. And so part of the practice at Planet Forward is something that we call a listening tour. And we are currently engaged in another farmer listening tour. Of course, we're having to do it virtually now. You know, back in January and February, we're still jumping um, in the car and, and driving out to see folks. But it's really about understanding what's happening at the farm level for the farmer and for the farm worker. And what are the blockers to implementing more regenerative practices? Or for example, what kind of incentives need to be in place to encourage more farmers to use these kind of management practices? What kinds of market premiums could accelerate the conversion to these kind of regenerative practices? I can't know that on my own. And I have to go out and be in conversation with folks and listen in order to be able to really understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a another great entrepreneurial lesson, you know, is of, of doing the research yourself, going and seeing what's really going on and understanding, you know, what, what your customers, or in this case, your suppliers uh, uh, need and, and want. And are you looking at it also from the lens of, you, know, you said, so, so not only about the regeneration, but, but also in terms of, of employment or labor at all, um, you know, the, the Central Valley is sort of fraught with uh, labor difficulties. Yeah, I think you'd be hard pressed to find any industry right now that isn't fraught with um, labor difficulties. And there's a huge imperative for folks to do better. Um, it is the case that California wants to be at the leading edge of a lot of those conversations. We do see change happening. Um, Planet Forward is very interested in the degree to which um, farm management practices lead to better health outcomes, but we are also definitely looking at um, issues of wages, hours, and all sorts of um, issues that need to be remedied in order for the people who are farming the land to be healthy. Um, for me and for, for my team, um, the conversation is always about people first. I think the last wave of environmentalism focused very much on the planet as if the planet were something worth saving, but, but people maybe weren't. And at Planet Forward, we're very much interested, of course, in the health of the planet. But frankly, the planet will be here. Dirt will be dirt and carbon will be carbon. What we also have to fight for is, is human lives. And so we do have a very people-centric approach to the way that we think about our work, including things like thinking about labor practices on farms. Maybe this is a good time. I know that uh, you've been involved in some anti-racism work as well. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that and, and what you're doing there. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say, I think the, the work that I'm doing, I'm very much just picking up the, the baton from my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents and all of the ancestors that came before me that have been involved in this fight and in this struggle. Um, I am on the one hand very encouraged by the amount of activity that I see happening. I feel in particular very proud of millennials and Gen Z for the way that folks are getting out and making their voices heard. And on the other hand, I, um, I also feel uh, some measure of, I don't wanna call it cynicism, but there's a part of me that wonders how well this conversation can be sustained over time. And so the work that I am mostly doing is around that second question. What can individuals, founders, investors, and organizations do over a sustained period of time to help dismantle structural racism and end white supremacy? It isn't enough to make 2020 the year of anti-racism. We frankly need to continue this work forever. So, you know, my work in this area has, has sort of run the gamut. Um, in particular, the role that I am, am sort of uniquely positioned to play, I think, is to be um, an advisor to folks who are in my community of founders who want to build anti-racist organizations from the beginning. 
and then where I have the opportunity to try to influence investors uh, to look more closely at investing in black founders in particular. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, because we have so many founders here, uh, can you give a couple of, of I want to say simple, nothing is simple, um, but some tactical advice on how to make sure that you're creating an organization that doesn't have sort of implicit bias and racism built in? Yes. Well, and that is a wonderful question. Um, and at the same time, I will say um, that there really is no possibility that an organization, from my perspective, as a Black American living today, um, it is impossible for me to imagine a system or an organization that exists right now that hasn't been imbued with racism already. Mm -hmm. Because racism has been the prevailing doctrine of our country for so long. The question is, first for me, first and foremost, and what I ask people to do is to take a personal inventory of the beliefs, the behaviors, and the practices in your own life that map to greater inequality. And I literally mean take an inventory write it down. For me, there isn't much sense in trying to believe that one who's been a part of this American society doesn't have some racist practices in their lives. The, that for me is almost an impossible thing to believe. To live in America and to have benefited from the society means that there is some racism, some lack of equality that's inherent in, 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 in each of us. What is more important is to take an inventory of those practices. And then the second thing is commit to changing them. And committing to changing them, you know, tactically might mean create a circle of accountability. Like I've been super encouraged over the last month by my fellow Stanford Business School classmates who independently of asking me to be like sort of like their black accountability partner, which by the way, you know, I want to do, but it is taxing it for, for black people to be charged with simultaneously, uh, you know, dismantling structural racism on our own, weathering the storm, protecting our own psychological, physical safety, and then also showing up to educate our white allies or our non-black allies what I think is more encouraging is when I see independently of me, friends, colleagues, associates, establishing circles of accountability around anti-racism. There might be uh, accountability around how to be a, an anti-racist parent, how to be an anti-racist investor, how to be an anti-racist manager, and I think those kind, you know, if you were training for a marathon, you often have a training partner who you go out and you, and you do this work with. The same needs to be the case for anything as big as trying to dismantle racism in your life. You need an accountability partner. And I think the third thing is to understand each of us has a unique role to play. You cannot play all the roles well. Understand what you're uniquely positioned to do and do exactly that. If you're somebody who has a big voice, use that voice. If you're somebody who's really good at building, create something. If you're somebody who's really good at connecting, make connections. If you're somebody who's blessed with a lot of financial resources, then figure out ways to redistribute some of those resources to create more equality. Oh, that is a fantastic response. I think that, you know, this is a, a really interesting moment because we might be transitioning to a world in which these things are much more deeply considered and much more deeply thought. As you said, it, you know, it isn't like 2020 is the year, like hopefully this is simply the beginning of a long process, or hopefully a little short process, but a process mm -hmm. that gets us to a much more equitable uh, society. That is, uh, those are great. Um, in terms of being a founder and raising money and running companies and everything else, are there some unique challenges that, that you face or, or just actually, I think all founders face lots of challenges, but are there some unique ones that you felt 
either because being a woman or a woman of color uh, that you've experienced here in, in Silicon Valley? Yeah, and I could, I could probably spend a day or a week or a month just lining up all of the anecdotes of things that range from mildly problematic to truly heartbreaking that have happened in my own life and in the lives, lives of my friends and partners. But there's probably just a few data points that bring the whole conversation to a really fine point. You know, I think I was talking to Pam Koska of Allrays today on a chat and let's see the number of uh, women led uh, startups that got funding last year was something like 12%. And then when you look at the number of those that were founded by Latinx people or Latinx people who identify as women, the number is less than 1%. And then when you look at the number of black female founders who were funded last year, it was six ten thousandths of a percent. Oh, which is a rounding error, which is much closer to zero than any other whole number that you would logically round up to. So I can, of course, share my own personal anecdotes, but I think even just looking at that number is worth 10 million anecdotes. Um, and all of that, and, and all of that uh, truth exists and it can feel very weighty and heavy and it is. But nonetheless, I do think this is a very, very good time to be uh, a black woman building a business. I think we are at an inflection point. I think so many of the old rules don't apply about what leaders look like, what leaders sound like, who gets invested, what's venture backable, what's a big idea. All of those rules are being rewritten. And so, you know, I, I say to anyone out there who feels, um, like this is like this is a challenge. Of course it is, but please, but please do it anyway because the world needs your voice and the world needs the kind of solutions that are being built built by by diverse people. Yeah, yeah, hear, hear. That's uh, I, I, you know, anecdotes are one thing, but you know, the data speaks for itself. You know, it really shows that the problem is is real and needs to be uh, corrected systemically. Um, what is your biggest challenge at the moment as, mm. you know, as a founder of any sort? My biggest, Mark, my biggest challenge at the moment as a founder is just the challenges of being a human right now. <laughs> I was talking to my dear, dear friend um, who I went to high school with um, uh, before I, I jumped on with, with this amazing group. and. Um, He's like, there are really only two things this year. The first is, you know, safeguard your physical health. And the second is just keep your head screwed on. And <laughs> to me, it's just that simple this year. I try to really make sure that I'm being safe and keeping my family safe from a COVID perspective as much as I possibly can. And I work just to stay in a really balanced and ultimately optimistic mindset. And I feel like for this year, Mark, if I can do those two things, then that is plenty. Of course, I worry about supply chain disruption, hiring, technology risk, you know, will consumers care about climate friendly food in the midst of everything? There are always, you know, the list of 10 million things that, that I worry about. But primarily this year, it's about my physical and mental health. Yeah, I think that's that's a, a very wise decision. Um, let me just see here. Have you had? And this is you know the the, the theme of our uh, of our you know summit is never give up. Mm. Uh, and I'm curious, have you had your sort of never give up moment? And I know you know it might have been through you know a past thing you know with Zoom or something else. But um, was there some moment and then you kind of plowed through it? Oh, oh my gosh. Well, first, <laughs> of all, you know, it's, in, it's my, my nature is that I actually run really hot. I have, I'm a super passionate person. I work very hard to like stay on this even keel with lots of equanimity that requires lots of meditation and lots of physical exercise. But I am somebody by my nature who runs very hot, which means that I will 
I will drive myself very, 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 very hard. And, and then at some point, inevitably, I will want to give up. Um, either because I push myself too hard or because I'm, because I'm, you know, pushing myself so hard that size of the problems that I'm encountering are growing, which by the way is healthy and good. So I love the phrase never give up. For me, actually, I've given up uh, probably a hundred times. And so it's, it's, it's surely, I, I, I understand the point of don't give up, but for me, the mantra is probably closer to like, like, like fall down and get back up. And in the moments where you feel like giving up, just honor that feeling. Like don't, don't get into a place of like judging, now judging yourself for having given up. Like just kind of relish that moment where you're like, I just, I'm done. Let yourself feel it. Try to observe that feeling without judgment. And then do something to delight yourself. Go take a nap, take a walk, play with your dog, play with your kid, you know, eat something yummy. And then see if you feel a little different later on. Um, that's what I would say. You know, when have I wanted to give up? I remember there was a night early in the days of Zoom Pizza when we ran a promo. Um, I forget what this promo was, but it was something really juicy. It was like two for one pizza. Like, of course, everyone would want that. But you have to remember, this was early in the days of Zoom Pizza. And I think at the time, we had probably only like 16 customers or something really small. And so we thought, even if we have a 4x surge, we can surely handle that level of volume. Only everyone in the world wanted two for one pizza and it was also like a rainy Friday night and we didn't have a 4X surge, we had something like a 20X surge. It was outrageous how many orders we had to fulfill. Every single one of us jumped in our cars and started delivering pizza. I called my family from San Francisco to drive to Mountain View because I knew we would need more folks. And it was just an abominable failure. Delivery times were like two hours long. <laughs> People were so angry at us. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's it. Like, we'll never win these customers back. And, and how in the world did I think I could do this anyway? And I just went really, really deep down the rabbit hole and my investors will hate me and da 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 da. And I just kind of let myself stay in that place for a night. And then I told myself, you know, by tomorrow night, you're going to be in a different place than I was. And I've had many of these moments, whether it was at Zoom Pizza or back in my days of building restaurants or, you know, when you push out a feature and it fails. And there's so many of these times. So for me, it's, it's always about like having a little more grace every time I fall down and being able to get back up just a little bit faster every time. Oh, that is, that is fantastic advice. Um, that is, fair. I think we're going to open it up to questions now. Great. I believe people have been, I hope, posting questions in the chat. And, uh, and I'm looking now, I have a special secret feed. Um, <laughs> of course we <you> do. <laughs> yeah, of, of the first question, I'm looking for Q1 here, which I can't find. it would be right at the bottom, Mark. Ah, thank you for that. Ah, yes. Uh, it's from um, Ashika Thomas of Sparrow Ventures. What's your, oh, I'm going to let her, I'm going to, un, it's, she's going to get unmuted and ask you the question herself. Hi, Julia. So clearly you're a foodie and especially being from the Bay Area, like the diversity of foods here is astounding so my question is what is your favorite food or what is your go-to food or like what's your like like yeah basically that's just it so yeah i was just wondering yeah one of the things i'm working on right now is called the climatarian's cookbook it's all about recipes tips and tricks to help reduce your carbon footprint at home and so what i get really excited about now is leftovers so 40%, it's not a surprise to you that about 40% of the food that gets produced winds up getting wasted. Um, and if we could reduce the amount of food that we waste, it would be like taking millions and millions and millions and millions of um, gasoline burning cars off the road. So I get really excited about what's in my own fridge. 
and how I can mix and match it to make something yummy. I find that spring roll wrappers are the perfect way to take any little bits from your refrigerator and make them just a little bit yummy. Super cool, thank you. I love that. Um, the next question is from Mohammed um, Balal, if you could unmute. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello, Julia. How are you doing? Doing good? Okay. Uh, thank you for like uh, giving me the opportunity to ask a question. Um, before we go on, I just wanted to share one thing uh, as we were talking about racism in this session and before that was, uh, it was about uh, a guru in uh, Sikhism and he mentioned uh, one of his teachings that uh, we should recognize the human race as one. And that was one was his, one of his teachings that I think really should uproot and be in front of the world in times like these. So um, on top of that, my question is, uh, um, I've seen like the plan forward and everything. Um, what is your opinion on uh, air pollution and uh, the ability to reverse it by air purifiers? Because I have uh, my MVP, my startup is a smart air purifier that's uh, powered by the AWS cloud. So I monitor, you monitor the air quality data through it and then you filter the air as well. So in a nutshell, it's like I'm trying to make people live longer. So like elixir of life, okay? So um, it's, uh, I would just say like, uh, there are things that uh, initially in, at a very small scale might give a very small effect. But like when you put in the chaos theory in motion, imagine a lot of people purifying the air in their house as well as it would affect the environment in an aspect so that might reverse and the data can support it what yes. do you have your opinion what you and i are both trying to do with our businesses is to solve the most urgent environmental problems certainly climate change is one of them but pollution is also a huge environmental problem and disproportionately affects folks at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. So a solution that can be implemented that helps purify the air and reduce the amount of pollution that human beings are experiencing is a great solution. And at the end of the day, another thing that you and I have in common is we're interested in uplifting the quality of human lives. And it certainly sounds like you're building a solution to do that. So I, I commend you, keep going. I'm excited to see your solution in the market. Okay, our next question is from Michelle R. If you could unmute, please. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much. You're basically like goals and such a <laughs> such an inspiration. Um, so my question, and I'm like kicking myself that I misused the word your the wrong way because I'm a grammar freak. Um, so you're like basically like my dream advisor. Um, my I'm like a food product company and we are all about environmental sustainability and um, upcycling to prevent environmental waste. So my question is how as a young company um, do, can we or should we reach out to experienced founders? Because you mentioned you do like being an advisor. How can we do that? Because you're so busy. We, we understand that. I don't want to overwhelm you, um, but you have so much experience. And how can we catch your attention? And how do we like, make that initial outreach and, and really um, foster that relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is to like make the outreach, you know, you never know what's happening on the other side. And I've been in this position and still am um, quite frequently. I'm always reaching out to people, whether it's for fundraising or advice. I'd say, you know, the thing that I try to do when I when I'm reaching out is to um, keep it brief and to have a really clear idea of what you're looking for in the conversation. You know, it might be a quick a uh, tactical piece of feedback. It might be the opportunity to present your idea. Um, but I think the more concise and specific you can be in terms of what you're reaching out for, the easier it is for the person on the other side to assess the degree to which they can be helpful. I think also, you know, I, I, I'm very persistent. <laughs> if I want to get myself in front of them, someone I I don't mind trying one, two, or three times to get them. And I just space out those interactions a little bit um, in between. And then sort of the final silver bullet is sometimes 
just that one person in between who can make the warm intro, when you can find that, that's, that's like gold. But make the ask, be specific and concise, be persistent, and see if you can work your network to get a soft intro. That's what I'd say. And as it pertains to you and me, just hit me up on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to chat to you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I want to echo that in that um, using LinkedIn to find those connections uh, to get a little bit of a, a tiny warm, uh, warm intro is, is helpful for a lot of people. Uh, our next question is from uh, Arshia Kirani, and I'm sorry that I butchered your name, but if you could unmute and please answer, uh, ask your question. Hi. Um, yeah, you actually said it perfectly. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, this is an awesome topic. Um, I uh, own an apparel company. And um, my question is around metrics. Um, we, and, and like, how, like this idea of regenerative agriculture, um, and rebounds in carbon, um, and sequestering carbon. How, my question is like, how do you actually measure the output of that like we've tried to do that as a brand and like because our quantities are so much smaller it's like we're talking about like 0.0001 like of like tons you know when we're talking about carbon emission and so it doesn't feel like it's an effective metric to communicate one it's like very difficult to even calculate that but two it doesn't feel like an effective metric to calculate so i i guess i'm just wondering like as a company like how do you propose that small brands that don't have volume um tackle those metrics because i think those metrics are what like drive the customer decision um and like yeah i guess like do you, is do you know of any organizations that you can outsource that to to like do those calculations for you um and or just resources online yeah, I know it's 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 so interesting because a lot of the tools that exist aren't well suited for early stage companies, which is one of the things that I found when I was building the the Moonshot Snack brand. Um, we've used a variety of tools, and 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 some of them work better for, than others. Um, economic modeling data can be sort of the lightest weight touch that you can use as an early stage organization. Um, we've used a lot of LCA uh, analysis as well. Um, and then there are some sort of third party companies that do, you know, carbon accounting or uh, scope one, two and three emissions measurement as a service. I'm happy to um, put some of those resources together in an email for you. I'd say, that, you know, from a more conceptual level, although your emissions are small right now, you will be successful and you will grow and they will grow over time but you're doing a really good job um, in building into the DNA of your company, this idea that we are carbon neutral or we are carbon negative or we are building carbon uh, uh, neutral supply chains from the very beginning. Um, I think it's a whole lot harder to try to reverse engineer the carbon impact of your supply chains and products when you're a later stage company. So although the impact on, a, on an absolute basis may seem small now, Conceptually and strategically, what you're doing is important, not just in terms of being able to reach consumers, but frankly, in terms of guaranteeing that in, your, in the future, your company will have the kind of beneficial climate impact that you intend for it to have. Fantastic. Um, our next question is from Anna uh, Never, Neverova. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. It's just been incredible hours. So thank you for Sarah and thank you for Julia. I had a chance to meet Julia a few years ago at the GSB when she shared her story at Zoom and uh, treated us to delicious pizza. So I still remember that and also the promo. So thank you so much for being here and for your candor and enthusiasm. Um, it's just incredibly contagious and inspiring. And my question is, how does your journey at Zoom and what you've learned, especially around fundraising and scaling, inform what you're doing at Planet Forward today? Yeah, I love this question. It's nice to see you again. That was a fun day eating that pizza at the GS. That feels like a much simpler time in life, doesn't it? <laughs> um, you know, for me, like my entrepreneurial journey um, began, you know, before Zoom, actually back in back when I was living in New York City. Um, and so much of 
what I learned began in my very early days of bootstrapping companies, you know, like funding my company off of credit cards. And I'm not talking about like nice, fancy Amex. I'm talking about like $12,000 credit limits, you know, strung together. Um, fundamentally, what I've learned across all of those experiences with fundraising is, um, you know, you have to have the resources um, and you have to have the cash in order to be able to scale and grow. You know, cash is like oxygen. That, that is said very often and I believe that it's true. But it is also really important to have the right people around you to advise you, to stress test your ideas, sometimes just to encourage you and keep you going. And something that I think I've gotten very good at over the years is developing relationships during the fundraising process that sometimes might, might not result in a check or an investment, but that can be fruitful in terms of advice or resources or help down the road. And to really use the process of fundraising, not just to capitalize your business, but also to build a bench of advisors and supporters and cheerleaders who can help you in many, in the million other ways that you're gonna need help as a founder. Great. And I think we have time for one more question, really. Uh, and it's from um, Adriana uh, Panula. Adriana, can you unmute? Well, I'll read the question. Uh, it says, can you expand more on how the roles and rules of women and diversity are being elevated? What have you seen that works in changing that conversation? How the roles and rules of being women have been elevated. What am I seeing that's changing that conversation? Well, you know, I am seeing more um, female GPs raising funds. Um, I am seeing organizations like All Raise who are absolutely holding the venture community accountable to increasing representation among its partners. More recently, I'm seeing funds figure out what they can begin to do immediately to create a more diverse partnership. Some funds are creating internship opportunities for, for diverse founders and for women. Some funds are beginning to recruit partners from outside of the traditional sort of venture world. These are small changes, but if I imagine them or, or can, can see them being continued over a sustained period of time, then I do believe that they'll map to greater equality. Um, I also just see in the macroeconomic climate a real activation, um, I, I, I believe, being led by millennials and Gen Z that just aren't having it anymore. People are not here for this racism in the way that prior generations um, have allowed it to be so. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm realistically optimistic that change is happening. Um, and I see it uh, in my own little world of, of, of being in food tech and, and on this founder journey, I do see it happening within my own sphere. Oh, that's great. And that's a, a very nice note uh, to end on. Do you have any, any final advice for founders? <laughs> you know, I categorically, Mark, do not give advice. I try just to share elements of my story. And, and when they're aligned for people, um, it, it'll resonate. But again, I think I'll just say, say this, that the thing that I'm, two things that I'm really focused on this year are safeguarding my physical health and immunity and safeguarding my, my emotional and spiritual well-being.